Welcome everyone. In this video, we'll be talking about strategies for creating clear and informative image-based figures. You can find more detail about the content that I'm going to discuss today in this publication on PLOS Biology's website entitled Creating Clear and Informative Image-Based Figures for Scientific Publication. And you'll find that the publication, in addition to the figures that I'll show you today and the recommendations, also includes data illustrating how commonly these practices are found in image-based figures across three different fields, plant biology or plant sciences, cell biology, and physiology. Slides that I'm going to present are also available on the Open Science Framework in the data and code repository for the project. So if you're interested in sharing this content with another group that you work with, you're welcome to download the slides and use or adapt them for your own purposes. One of the things I want to emphasize was that this paper and the meta research project was done by a group of early career investigators based around the world through the eLife Ambassador Program. And so we had researchers in many different countries and time zones working together as a virtual team to complete this project, which was originally proposed by Helena Yambor at the uh, Technical University of Dresden. Okay, there are seven steps to preparing image-based figures, and we'll go through each of them in detail, but I wanted to start off with a brief summary. So the first step is to choose a magnification and scale that fits your research question. The second step is to add a clearly labeled scale bar. The third step is to use color wisely. The fourth is to choose a colorblind accessible color palette. The fifth is to design your figure. The sixth is to annotate your figure, and the seventh is to prepare legends. And we'll be talking in this session about image-based figures. So some things that we included in our assessments were microscopy and electron microscopy images, photographs, and then images taken using clinical imaging techniques, such as MRI or echocardiography or Doppler ultrasound. Okay, so as I mentioned on the last slide, the first step is to choose a magnification and scale that fits your research question. Different magnifications allow readers to see different features of your images. So for example, in this image here, we have three different scales shown of the same image. In the first image, we are looking at things of the, on the tissue scale. So we are looking at ovary tissue of a Drosophilia, and this would be an appropriate image if we have something about the level of ovarian tissue. In the next image, labeled 2, we have the cellular scale, so this is showing an egg chamber within an oocyte. And in the third image, we have a subcellular scale, which is showing RNA granules in the epithelial cells. So you would need to choose one of these three scales depending on which features the viewer would need to see in order to understand the answer to your research question. Sometimes we need to see more than one scale in order to allow us to answer the research question. And in this case, a common technique is using insets. So we show an image in a larger scale, and then we show a small zoomed in subsection of that same image or an inset that allows us to see finer detail. When we're using insets, we want to ensure that the inset is both accurately marked and clearly explained. And we saw numerous examples of problems with the way that insets were used in scientific papers. Here's some examples of things that you should avoid. So in the first case here, we have a wrongly placed inset. So the inset box is a region with no cells, and yet we see cells and structures in the actual inset that we're looking at. So the alignment of the inset box is not the place where the image was actually taken from. In the second case, we have no inset marked, and the inset itself is actually obstructing part of the data in the image we're meant to be looking at. In the third case, the origin of the inset isn't marked, although the placement has been moved off to the side, so it's no longer obscuring the image itself. And then in the last case, we again have no inset marked, and the inset itself is, construct in, is obstructing larger parts of the images. So these are all practices that we would like to avoid. The next step, once you've chosen your magnification, is to 
add a clearly labeled skill bar so that readers know what magnification you're working with. So why are scale bars so important? Many of us learned about the importance of scale, scar, scale bars in grade school science class, and yet there are still many papers and scientific publications that don't use them. And this is especially true for researchers who are working with photographs. Things are a little bit better for microscopy images. So I just want to emphasize that every image needs a scale bar. Difference in size could potentially indicate a difference in phenotype that may be very important for reproducibility. So if your plants or your mice are 20% larger than someone else's, that might be an important difference in phenotype that you would want to investigate or know about. Scale bars as well as their labels should be clearly visible and we also want to annotate the scale bar dimensions on the image itself and not in the legends. So more traditionally investigators have put scale bar information about you know five micrometers or whatever it is that the scale is that information has gone in the legend and that takes a lot of extra time for the reader to, to go down to the legend see where the scale bar is and what it's indicating and then go back up to the figure um, to get that dimension image to interpret the figure. So having your scale bar on the, or your dimensions on the scale bar itself makes life easy for your reader and saves a lot of time. And this is especially true for large figures or figures with many panels where the um, <clears throat> legend ends up getting put on another page. Let's look at some examples of some common practices to avoid. So our first image here has no scale bar. In image number two, the scale bar is present, but it's very hard to read. It's blurry and illegible, perhaps due to compression problems with the image. In the third case, the scale bar is gray on a black and white image with a lot of gray, so the scale bar just blends into the background. In the fourth case, we have a colored scale bar, but the color is dark blue and it's blending into the black and blue of the image. In the fifth case, the scale bar is so small that it's very, very hard to even see that there's one present. And in the sixth case, we again have a scale bar that's blending into the black round. So we have dark purple and then a black scale bar um, on top of that. So we want to avoid scale bars that are illegible, that are too small, or that blend into the background. So what are some things you can do? Well, pick a nicely contrasting color. So if you have a black background, you might put your scale bar and the dimension in white so that it stands out. Maybe you have a background that is multicolored um, or that has you know, different shades of black and white and it's difficult to see your scale bar. Then you can put a semi-transparent white box over part of the image and then put the scale bar and the dimension in white so that it's easier to see and you have more contrast with the background. You can also include a ruler in your photographs of the scale bar. Again, photographs are one of the image types that are most commonly missing scale bars, and it's helpful to label your edge. So here we have a notation that the square edge is one centimeter. Here again, we have a nice um, an image that's labeled 10. First one in the bottom row, we have a nice white scale bar, and it's placed on the darkest gray part of the image. If you have a multicolored background or a dark background that's very hard to get a scale bar on, you can also put your scale bar with dimensions just below the image where it stands out against the white background of the rest of the page. And this avoids the problem of it blending into the background if you put it directly on the image. And then you can also, this is just another example of having a ruler as a scale bar with information about the sides of a square edge. So um, things to remember, add rulers to your photographs so that there's scale information visible and make sure that those scale bars or those rulers can actually be read. Um, scale bars should stand out against the background. And if the scale bar doesn't stand out, you can place it over a semi-transparent white box or place a labeled scale bar below your image. The next thing is to use color wisely. So when we use color well, we enhance readers' understanding, but when we use color poorly, it can be distracting or misleading. Color is called a pre-attentive attribute, and that means that if you use color in your figure, readers are our eyes naturally respond um, to that use of color. And so it's important that we use color in a smart way as we're working on our images. So let's start out by talking about when one should use color. 
We'll go through a series of examples. So here off, here we'll start off with a color photograph. Um, and this is simply to illustrate the appearance of, uh, or the natural appearance of a particular object or thing. In this case, you do want to use color. Um, you may be able to use grayscale depending on the contrast. You'll have to look and see whether or not the features that you're most interested in are visible in the grayscale version. With a microscopy image of one color, you might want to consider using grayscale for higher contrast. It's often easier for our brains to detect um, shades of white and black and gray than it is to detect shades of color against a darker background. So if you have one color for microscopy only, even though it's not as pretty, using grayscale can actually be easier for people to interpret. When you have two or three colors, um, you are often using the colors to show co-localization or to show the location of different structures or different things that are being stained for. Um, we'll talk a little bit in the next section about some strategies for making two and three color images with microscopy that are colorblind accessible. And then the last option is electron microscope images. These are grayscale by default, and therefore you would use grayscale and not have color in these images. One of the important things to keep in mind when you're choosing your color or deciding whether to use color is that the visibility of colors depends on the background color. And so here we have the best visibility options on the top row, medium visibility in the center, and then worst visibility on the bottom. And you can see a grayscale visibility test here on the right to get a sense of what features might be missing with each of these color options. So our best visibility comes with the highest contrast options. So these are things like inverted grayscale with black on white or blue on white or white on black grayscale. Our middle options are yellow, cyan, or green on black, and the worst visibility are the darker colors, magenta on black, red on black, or blue on black. Blue on black is particularly bad. You can see a lot of information is missing here because dark blue looks very similar to black, and so there are entire structures that we simply can't see. So blue should be really avoided whenever possible. The next thing that it's important to do is to choose colorblind accessible colors. So we want to remember here that the most common form of colorblindness affects up to 8% of men and half a percent of women of Northern European ancestry. So when you think about all of the people that see your paper before it goes through to publication, your co-authors, your reviewers, and your editors, it's very likely that at least one of those people may be colorblind. And by the time that paper gets out to your readers, many of them will be colorblind. If your figures aren't colorblind accessible, they will be missing key information from your, um, from your visualization. There will be elements that they simply cannot understand, evaluate, and appreciate because they're not able to see features in the colors that you've shown. So you might be thinking, well, I'm not colorblind, so how do I tell whether my figure is colorblind accessible? There are a number of free tools that you can use to simulate what a colorblind person would see. And every colorblind person is different, so these tools aren't per perfect, but they will give you a sense of what someone with different forms of colorblindness might see when they were examining your image. So here we have an image of a little lizard on a plant, and we have that in normal color vision. Um, how it might look to someone with deuteranopia, which is the most common form of colorblindness, and how it might look to someone with tritinopia, which is the least common form of colorblindness. And we can see here that the red-green color combination is bad for people with the most common form of colorblindness because those two colors look the same, whereas the red-green combination is okay for someone who has the least common form of colorblindness. One example of a free tool that you can use is a tool called Color Oracle. And I've listed the website here, but you should be able to download this in about 30 seconds. It will stall, install a little color wheel um, on either your top bar or your bottom bar, depending on what type of operating system you're using. And you can simply click a button and then select a form of color blindness to change the colors on your screen into what someone with that form of color blindness would see. 
Okay, let's talk about some color accessible, colorblind accessible color combinations when we're working with microscopy. So many of you already will know that green and red is a very popular color combination in microscopy, and you can see here what that looks like for someone with normal color vision, for someone with the most common form of color blindness, deuteranopia, and for someone with the least common form of color blindness, tritinopia. Um, red and green is a problem for people with the most common form of color blindness because these two things look the same. Another common color combination we see is green and blue, and this works okay for people with the most common form of color blindness, but is not good for people with the least form of color, common form of color blindness because the blues and greens appear the same. Cyan and magenta is a nice colorblind safe option when you're working with two colors. It works for people with both forms of colorblindness. Sometimes we're imaging something that maybe has green fluorescent protein or is naturally green. And in that case, some investigators prefer to stick with the green channel instead of changing it to cyan. And so green and magenta is also a color combination that's reasonably good for colorblind individuals. Let's talk now about some strategies for making two or three channel microscope images colorblind safe. And so the best options here are at the bottom, whereas the least good options are at the top. And so we'll start off with the images at the top where we have a microscope image in two colors on the left and in three colors on the right. And we can see in our two color microscope image um, that the color combination of red and green is not colorblind accessible. And so our first option here is to change to a colorblind accessible color combination, such as cyan and magenta. For the three Com or for, for three channel microscopy with three different colors, there is no color combination that works really well. So your options, if you want to simply change your colors are to use two colors that are colorblind safe and then an extra panel showing your third color. And here we have blue on black, which again is low contrast and not good. Another option that you can use is to use cyan and magenta against gray, and whether this works will depend on where your gray is located compared to the cyan and magenta. Here, all of the colors are overlapping and doesn't work particularly well. Some better options are to show each of your channels separately, and you could then show a merged image next to them, and ideally all of this would be in a colorblind safe color palette. You can also show split channels in grayscale or in inverted grayscale to help readers see the contrast and the locations more effectively. Okay, let's talk next about strategies for designing your figure. There are three steps that you'll want to follow when you design your figure. The first is to define your figure objective. And ideally, we want all elements within that figure to answer a single research question. This isn't always possible due to the limits on the number of figures in scientific publications, but when it is possible, you should try to ensure that all elements in your figure are addressing one research question. The next step is to organize and plan your figure using a figure planning table. And once you have your table, you want to organize and structure your panels using a figure layout sketch. Let's take a look at this process as an example. Okay, so um, here, I have an example of a figure planning table. Um, where you can see that I have my first panel is to illustrate the differences in pop phenotype. My second is to illustrate the differences in placenta phenotype. And the third is to illustrate histological differences in placenta. So for example, staining for two biomarkers. Um, I'm going to make some notes in this table about not only the panels and the objective of each panel, but also the visualizations that go within each panel, the experimental groups, and um, additional notes. So for my visualizations, I want to have a photograph and a chart in panels A and B. And I'm going to have four sets of groups, a uh, control group that received placebo, experimental group that received placebo, a control group that received treatment, and an experimental group that received treatment. And then for my notes, I might note that I'm going to need a photograph for illustrating differences in pop phenotype, and I want to take that photograph with a ruler so that I have a scale bar. 
and that I might be using a box plot to then illustrate the actual data for pop weight. I might have the same notes for illustrating differences in the phenotype of the placenta. When it comes to illustrating histological differences in the placenta, so staining for two biomarkers, I might note that I want one image representative per group and separate rows for each biomarker. So what might this look like in a figure layout sketch? Well, I can have a layout either in rows or in columns. So for most of us, our eyes move from left to right or from top to bottom. The layout in rows follows the natural eye pattern movements from left to right, whereas the layout in columns follows the motion from top to bottom. And you'll see in both of these cases, I want to have white spaces separating my rows and columns and panels. So this again helps to guide the eye through the figure and separate out my different panels from each other. So if I were doing a layout in rows, I might have panel A and B in my first row. I might have data for the first biomarker in the next row, and that would be panel C. And then I might have a second row for panel C with the data for biomarker two. In contrast, with my layout and columns, I might have the photo in the box plots for panels A and B in the first column. And then I might use a square structure to illustrate the four groups and have one square above for biomarker one and one below for biomarker two. So panel or column two is the entirety of the second panel. Our third step or our sixth step is to annotate the figure. There are a variety of different annotations that we can use. So let's take a look at some options. So this table lists the feature to be explained as well as the type of annotation that we might use. So we've already talked about annotations for helping us appreciate the size of an object. We want to use a scale bar with dimensions. If we want to show the direction of movement, then we're going to need an arrow with a tail. We might want to draw attention to particular features. So for example, we can draw attention to points of interest by using a symbol like an arrowhead or a star. We might want to draw attention to regions of interest um, on a black and white image by highlighting that region in color or by outlining the area with boxes or circles. If we want to show regions of interest on a color image, we can again outline with boxes or circles. Sometimes we have layers on our image that we want a reader to understand. We can either place label brackets beside each layer on the image or draw a line that corresponds to the layer separation or the separation between each set of layers on that image and then label the layers on the side. And lastly, when we want to define features within an image, we would use labels. We'll talk about four annotation strategies. Um, the first is to use arrows. So arrows point to a structure, but we need to be cautious because they can also indicate the direction of movement. So you would want to avoid using arrows for pointing out a structure as well as for indicating movement. Um, if we indicate an arrowhead alone without a tail, it often has no clear direction and is just pointing a structure. Some general tips, it's important to avoid crossing arrows and when possible to align arrows so that they follow a similar path towards the image. In terms of the next set option we can use is a strategy for delineating a region of interest or an entire structure. And here we can draw circles or boxes around the region that we want to highlight. The third strategy is to use lines. And so here I have a line going into the image and then the label showing what that line represents or the reason that that line is pointing to appears outside the image so that it's not obstructing the image and it's easy to read. The last option is to use letter codes or symbols. And this is often used when we want to highlight every feature or every time a particular feature appears on an image. So for example, A, denotes all of the nerve cell nuclei within this image. Um, this can be a useful strategy in some cases, but if you don't want to label every structure, then it can be unnecessary and also obstruct features in the image. The next thing that's important is to choose the right amount of labeling. And so if we look at this in image here, um, we have three different levels of annotation, no annotation, some annotation, and then excessive labels. In our first image, there is no annotation. And we see things like this quite often in scientific papers. Now, if you happen to be a researcher who does, um, 
electron microscopy on mouse pancreatic beta, beta islet cells, then you may know exactly what this is and understand exactly what you're looking at and how it relates to your research question. But if you're not someone who works with this type of tissue or imaging or species, you may have no idea what's being shown here or how it relates to the research question the author is trying to answer. And so this image would not be especially informative. In the next image, we have some annotations. So we've denoted key structures like the nucleus and the cytoplasm. There's also a colored shaded region highlighting the area where the peripheral insulin secretory vesicles are found. And there's some arrows labeling where the mitochondria appear in this cell. And this is very helpful because it orients the readers to key structures. It doesn't obscure the image in any way. All of the features are still visible. In the last image, we have excessive labels. So there are lots of different labels on all different parts of the structure, and they're absolute, they're obstructing parts of the image. The additional problem that we have here is the legend that appears below, which is entirely written in text. And so if I want to know what the blue region represents, I have to read down until I see blue shape, and then I know that that's chromatin. And this is quite an inefficient process if I have to do this for every symbol on this image. So this labeling is excessive. It's obstructing the image and the legend makes it particularly uninformative. But sometimes I might need this level of labeling to help a reader understand the image and answer my research question. So what can I do then? Here is a strategy for making your images informative when you have many annotations. So we can actually use a second copy of the image as its own legend. And to do that, we cover it with a semi-transparent white box that helps the label to stand out. And readers can then quickly compare from one to another to identify the regions that are marked in the legend and what they look like on the unaltered or unobstructed image. In addition, we've replaced that very large and ugly text legend with a visual, a visually appealing legend that uses symbols and colors so that I can quickly match the blue region in the legend to the blue region on the figure. And this makes it easier to interpret my image. Now, you'll notice here that the legend information appears directly below the figure as opposed to in the legend itself. This is a particularly effective strategy for making interpretation of the figure more efficient for your readers. When you place all of this information in the actual text figure legend below the figure, the reader has to be looked back and forth between the legend and the figure to get this information instead of sh simply shifting their eye down slightly to look at the legend that appears below the figure itself. And Putting all the information in a text legend at the bottom of the figure is especially problematic for large figures with many panels and for figures where the legend ultimately appears on a separate page. So putting this information right below your figure, again, makes it easier for your reader to quickly interpret what's going on. The next thing we need to do is explain our colors and stains. So here's some examples of some things that we would rather not see. Um, no color annotation. So here we have no information about what red and green represent. And another thing that we saw quite often was that people would explain the specific markers, but they wouldn't explain what the color for staining the control was. For example, if they were using blue for DAPI, they wouldn't say that. They would just assume that everyone knows that. And it's important when you want to make your images accessible for a broad audience that you not assume that people are familiar with the particular staining scheme that you're using. The second example, we have our colors defined, but they're in colors that are not colorblind safe, and so they won't be interpretable to everyone. Here we have illegible or incomplete annotations, so very small lettering at the bottom, and only one of the two colors is explained. And then here we have an annotation that obstructs the image itself. So how can we do this better? Well, here are some examples. So we can have colorblind safe annotation where our annotations appear in the colors that the image is shown in. However, those colors are colorblind safe. So they're easy for everyone to interpret and match what they see to the actual color shown. Or if we're not using colorblind safe colors, we could have separate channels and put the label for what the color means above that channel. 
And then in our last option here, um, we can state the names of the colors when the text has to be in grayscale. It's important when we're thinking about annotations to make sure that our annotations are colorblind safe. Many times we might check our images for colorblind safety, but forget to check the actual annotations that go on those images. So for example, in plant sciences, we found many cases where the authors had highlighted features using red arrows on green plants, which is not a colorblind safe option. And so here's some examples of this. You can see we have the red and green problem again. And for a colorblind reader, these two things all look the same, and this is very hard to interpret. So we can either switch this to a colorblind safe color palette for our annotations, or we can use black and white and use different weights of lines and different colors of symbols to make it clearer what the structures that we're labeling and referring are, for, or referring to are. And again, as a reminder, you can use free colorblind simulation programs like Color Oracle to quickly see how your figure and the annotations would look to a colorblind reader. Preparing figure legends. This topic is a little bit more complicated to give cohesive advice on. And the reason for that is journals have different requirements according to their particular style. So you would want to include information on the species and tissue or the object shown. We recommend including clear explanations of all labels and annotations, either as a legend on the figure itself or within the figure legend, as well as clear explanations of your colors and stains. And again, doing that on the figure itself is always um, easier for your reader to interpret. However, you're going to have to consult your journal for specific requirements about what they are looking for and what they do not want in the legends. So um, I think that is the end of this particular slide set. I would encourage you to consult the paper if you would like more information. And I look forward to talking to you all in class.